Everyone agreed that the day was just right for the picnic at Hanging Rock. Warm and still, cicadas shrilling from the locust trees outside the dining room windows. The boarders at Mrs Appleyard's College for Young Ladies were fluttering about in their holiday muslin like a flock of excited butterflies. Not only was it Saturday and the long-awaited occasion for the annual picnic, but St Valentine's Day. Mademoiselle de Poitiers, who taught dancing and French conversation, was assembling the girls for the final roll call. Dépêchez-vous! Miss McCraw vient d'arriver! Greta McCraw had undertaken picnic duty today, assisted by Mademoiselle, purely as a matter of conscience. A brilliant mathematician, far too brilliant for her poorly paid job at the college, she would have given a five-pound note to have spent this precious holiday, no matter how fine, shut up in her room with that fascinating new treatise on calculus. Now an immense purposeful figure was billowing in grey silk taffeta onto the veranda like a galleon in full sail. Good morning, girls. Good morning, Mrs. Appleyard. Well, young ladies, we are indeed fortunate in the weather for our picnic to Hanging Rock. As the day is likely to be warm, you may remove your gloves after the drag has passed through Wood End. You will partake of luncheon at the picnic grounds near the rock. Let me remind you that the rock itself is extremely dangerous and you are therefore forbidden to engage in any exploration, even on the lower slopes. It is, however, a geographical marvel on which you will be required to write a brief essay on Monday morning. I also wish to remind you that the vicinity is renowned for its venomous snakes and poisonous ants of various species. I think that is all. Have a pleasant day and behave yourselves in a manner to bring credit to the college. I shall expect you back, Miss McCraw and Mademoiselle, at about eight o'clock for a light supper. The covered drag from Hussey's livery stables, drawn by five splendid bay horses, was already at the college gates with Mr Hussey on the box. Well, Monty, mind your gloves on the wheel, Miss McCraw, it's dusty. At last, everyone was seated to the satisfaction of special friends, enemies and the two governesses. Thank you, Mr. Hussey. You may go now. Miss McCraw ordered, suddenly aware of her non-mathematical responsibilities. They were off. The morning grew steadily hotter. The sun bore down on the shiny black roof of the drag, now covered with fine red dust that seeped into eyes and hair. Greta McCraw muttered from the shadows. And this we do for pleasure, so that we may shortly be at the mercy of venomous snakes and poisonous ants. The angle of vision had gradually altered to bring the hanging rock into sudden startling view. The grey volcanic mass rose up like a fortress from the empty yellow plain, immense and formidable. At the summit, apparently bare of living vegetation, a jagged line of rock cut across the serene blue of the sky. Lunch had been set out on large white tablecloths, shaded from the heat of the sun by two or three spreading gums. In addition to the chicken pie, angel cake, jellies and tepid bananas, inseparable from an Australian picnic, Cook had provided a handsome iced cake in the shape of a heart. Hunger satisfied and the unwanted delicacies enjoyed to the last morsel, they settled down to amuse themselves. Miss McCraw had at last removed her kid gloves in which she had absently begun to eat a banana with disastrous results. Mademoiselle was relaxed at full length on the grass. Uh, sorry to disturb you, miss. What is it, Mr. Hussey? I want to make sure we get away no later than five. Of course. I shall see that the young ladies are ready. Uh, what time is it now? I was just going to ask you, miss. My old ticker seems to have stopped dead at 12 o'clock. Miss McCraw closed her book, sent an exploratory pair of bony fingers into the folds of the flat, puce bosom, and came out with an old-fashioned gold repeater on a chain. Stopped at 12. Never stopped before. I'll put the billy on again for a cup of tea before we go. Say, about an hour from now. Marion Quaid, producing some squared paper and a ruler, said, I should like to make a few measurements at the base of the rock if we have time. Miranda and Irma asked permission to take a walk as far as the lower slopes before tea. It was granted, after a moment's hesitation by Mademoiselle, Miss McCraw having disappeared again behind her book. How far is it, Miranda? Only a few hundred yards. 
We shall have to walk along by the can creek. Can I come too? I ate so much pie at lunch, I can hardly stay awake. Don't worry about us, mademoiselle. We shall only be gone a very little time. The governess stood and watched the four girls walking off toward the creek. Miranda stopped, turned her shining head and gravely smiled at Mademoiselle, who smiled back, and stood there waving until they were out of sight round the bend. Mon Dieu, now I know. What do you know? The Frenchwoman found herself tongue-tied. It simply wasn't possible to explain to Miss McCraw, of all people, her exciting discovery that Miranda was a Botticelli angel. Impossible to even think clearly. She lay down again on the warm, scented grass. The four girls were following the creek <laughs> upstream. It became deeper and clearer, presently opening out into a little pool ringed by grass. A stout, bewhiskered elderly man was lying fast asleep on his back. Nearby, a little woman in an elaborate silk dress sat with closed eyes. A slender, fair youth was absorbed in a magazine, while another, of about the same age, tough and sunburned, was rinsing champagne glasses at the pool. The hanging rock remained tantalizingly hidden behind tall forest trees. We must find a suitable place to cross over, or we shall see nothing before we have to turn back. I thought we'd take a flying leap and hope for the best. Can you manage it, Edith? I don't know. I don't want to wet my feet. Why not? I might get pneumonia and die, and then you'd stop teasing me and be sorry. <laughs> the water was crossed without mishap to the approval of the young coachman with a low, penetrating whistle. As soon as the girls were out of earshot, the youth in riding breeches strolled down towards the pool. Look here, Albert. I hope you don't mind my saying so, but I wish you hadn't done that. Done what, Mr. Michael? Whistled at those girls. It's a free country. What's the harm in a whistle? Only that you're such a good chap, and, and nice girls don't like being whistled at. Don't you believe it? The Sheilas is all alike. I, I say, Albert, I wish you'd cut out that Mr. Michael stuff. My name's Mike to you, unless my aunt's listening. Mike? Well, I'd better be harnessing up old Glory, or your auntie's fur will be flying. Righto. I'll just stretch my legs a bit before we go. Albert stood looking after the slim boyish figure clearing the creek and striding off towards the rock. Stretching his legs, is it? I don't mind betting he wants another look at them shearers. The four girls were already out of sight. Michael sat down on a fallen log. What was her name? The tall, pale girl with straight yellow hair, who had gone skimming over the water like one of the white swans on his uncle's lake. The hanging rock had risen up directly ahead of the four girls, clearly visible behind a short, grassy slope. On the steep, southern facade, the play of golden light and deep violet shade revealed the intricate, vertical slabs some smooth as giant tombstones, others grooved and fluted by prehistoric architecture of wind and water, ice and fire. Huge boulders, originally spewed red-hot from the boiling bowels of the earth, now came to rest, cooled and rounded in forest shade. Marion was the first to break the silence. Those peaks, they must be a million years old. A million? Oh, how horrible. My papa made a million out of a mine once in Brazil. He bought mama a ruby ring. Money's quite different. Whether Edith likes it or not, that fat little body of hers is made up of millions and millions of cells. Stop it. You're making me feel giddy. Well, don't tease her, Marion. The poor child's overtired. Yes. And those nasty ferns are pricking my legs. I never thought it would be so nasty. I wouldn't have come. Never mind, Edith. You can go home soon. We can't go much further. Remember, Irma, I promised Mademoiselle we wouldn't be long away. At least let us see what it looks like over this first little rise. The bracken soon gave way to a belt of dense, scratchy scrub, ending in a waist-high shelf of rock. If only we could stay out all night and watch the moon rise. Don't look so serious, Miranda, darling. 
We don't often have the chance to enjoy ourselves out of school. Without being watched and spied on by that little rat of a Lumley. <laughs> Blanche says she knows for a fact Miss Lumley only cleans her teeth on Sundays. Blanche is a disgusting little know-all, and so are you. <gasps> Blanche says Sarah Wayborn writes poetry. She found one on the floor about Miranda. Poor little Sarah. <laughs> I don't believe she loves anyone in the world except you, Miranda. I can't think why. She's an orphan. <gasps> Girls, I'm not feeling it all well. Edith, I do wish you would stop talking for once. Miranda was the first to see the monolith rising up ahead. A single outcrop of pockmarked stone like a monstrous egg perched above a precipitous drop to the plain. Marion yawned. Suddenly overcome by an overpowering lassitude, all four girls flung themselves down in the shelter of the monolith and fell into a sleep so deep that a horned lizard emerged from a crack to lie without fear in the hollow of Miranda's outflung arm. A procession of queer-looking beetles were making a leisurely crossing of Miranda's ankle when she awoke. In the colorless twilight, every detail stood out, clearly defined and separate, beautiful and complete. Marion's torn muslin skirts fluted like a nautilus shell. Irma's ringlets framing her face in exquisite wiry spirals. Even Edith, flushed and childishly vulnerable in sleep. She awoke, whimpering and rubbing red-rimmed eyes. <laughs> Where am I? The others were wide awake now and on their feet. Miranda, oh, I feel awful. Miranda was looking at her so strangely, almost as if she wasn't seeing her. Miranda, I feel perfectly awful. When are we going home? When Edith repeated the question more loudly, she simply turned her back and began walking away up the rise, Irma and Marion following a little way behind. Miranda? Miranda! In the breathless silence, her voice seemed to belong to someone else, a long way off, fading out amongst the rock walls. Come back! All of you! Don't go up there! Come back! Edith felt herself choking and tore at her frilled lace collar. Miranda! To her horror, all three girls were moving fast out of sight behind the monolith. Miranda, come back! She took a few unsteady steps towards the rise, and saw the last of a white sleeve parting the bushes ahead. Miranda! There was no answering voice. The awful silence closed in, and Edith began to scream. If her terrified cries had been heard by anyone, the picnic at Hanging Rock might yet have been just another picnic. Nobody did hear them. Edith plunged blindly into the scrub and ran, stumbling and screaming, towards the plain. About four o'clock in the afternoon of the picnic, Mrs. Appleyard awoke from a long, luxurious nap on the drawing room sofa. She had been dreaming, as she often did, of her late husband. How Arthur would have reveled in the respectable luxuries of life at Appleyard College. He had always, she remembered complacently, called her his financial genius. Already the college was paying handsome dividends. A few minutes later, still in the best of tempers and determined to be gracious on this pleasant holiday afternoon, she appeared at the schoolroom door. Well, Sarah, I hope you have learned your poetry so that you can go into the garden for the rest of the afternoon. The scraggy, big-eyed child who had automatically risen from the desk when the headmistress entered was shifting uneasily from one black-stocking spindle shank to another. Well, stand up straight and put your shoulders back. You're getting a dreadful stoop. Now then, have you got your lines by heart? It's no use, Mrs. Appleyard. I can't learn them. How do you mean, can't? I have tried. 
But it's so silly. I mean, if there was any sense to it, I could learn it ever so much better. Sense? You little ignoramus. I shall leave you now, Sarah, and expect you to be word perfect in half an hour. Otherwise, I am afraid I shall have to send you to bed instead of sitting up until the others return for supper. The schoolroom door closed, the key turned in the lock. Miranda says I mustn't hate people even if they are wicked. I can't help it, Miranda. I hate her. I hate her. The sun had gone down in a blaze of theatrical pink and orange behind the college tower. In the lamp-lit kitchen, Cook and a couple of the maids were playing cards at a scrubbed wooden table, capped and aproned, ready for the imminent return of the picnickers. The night gradually darkened and thickened. It was a few minutes past eight o'clock. Mrs. Appleyard, playing patience in her study, decided to ask Mr. Hussey to step inside for a glass of brandy. There was still enough left in the decanter since the Bishop of Bendigo had lunched at the college. At last, hooves on the high road, two advancing lights, the blessed scrape of wheels as the drag came slowly to a halt at the college gates. Why are there, sailor? Duchess, get over! From the dark mouth of the drag, the passengers came straggling one by one. Some crying, some sodden with sleep, all hatless, dishevelled, incoherent. First to come stumbling up the shallow steps was the Frenchwoman, passion under the light. Mademoiselle, what is the meaning of all this? This is Appleyard. Something terrible has happened. An accident? It's all so dreadful. I don't know how to begin. Compose yourself. A fit of hysterics will get us nowhere. And where in heaven's name is Miss McCraw? <laughs> we left her behind. I talk. Left her behind? Has Miss McCraw taken leave of her senses? Mr. Hussey was pushing through the sobbing, wide-eyed girls. Mrs. Appleyard, may I speak to you alone? I think the French lady is going to fight. He was right. Mademoiselle, exhausted with the strains and stresses of the day, had passed out on the hall carpet. From the servants' quarters, Minnie and Cook had come running. Miss Lumley was descending the staircase with a lighted candle. Smelling salts were produced for Mademoiselle and Brandy. Miss Lumley, get these girls to bed immediately. Minnie will help you. Now, Mr. Hussey. The door of Mrs. Appleyard's sitting room closed. If I might uh, have a drop of spirits, ma'am, before I begin. You may. I see you are exhausted. Now then, tell me as plainly as you can exactly what has happened. Ma'am, if only I could tell you. That's the worst of it. Well, nobody knows what's happened. Three of your young ladies and Miss McCraw are missing at the rock. For the inmates of Appleyard College, Sunday the 15th of February was a nightmare of indecision, half dream, half reality, alternating between wildly rocketing hopes and sinking fears. Mrs. Appleyard spent the greater part of Sunday alone in her study, following a conversation with Constable Bumfer of Wood End. If Sunday 15th had been a nightmare at the college, Monday 16th was worse, beginning with a ring at the hall door at 6 a.m. by a young reporter from a Melbourne newspaper, the first unwelcome caller of many, many more. The massive cedar door was opening and shutting from morning till night on a variety of callers, including a few male and female hyenas, drawn quite frankly and openly by the smell of blood and scandal. By morning of Tuesday the 17th, Constable Bumfer was seated opposite Michael, stiff on a high-backed chair. I think so. We had better start off with a few questions. Now then, when you saw the girls crossing the creek, did you recognise any of them? How could I? I've only been in Australia about three weeks and haven't met any young girls. I see. Just try and remember any little detail, even if it seems unimportant now. I watched them crossing the creek. They ordered it differently. How do you mean, differently? Ropes? Vaulting poles? But some of them were more agile. You know, more graceful. I got up and went over to speak to Albert, who was washing some glasses at the creek. And we had a bit of a talk, and, and I said I would like to take a little stroll before it was time to go home. What time was it then? I didn't look at my watch. But I knew my uncle wanted to leave not later than four o'clock. 
I began walking towards the hanging rock. The girls were already out of sight. I sat down for a few minutes on a fallen tree when Albert called out. I came back to the pool immediately and rode home. Will that do? Nicely, thank you, Mr Fitzhubert. Only one more thing I'd like to check up on before we get it written down. You mentioned seeing three girls crossing the creek. Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Of course, there were, there were four girls. I suppose you would have remembered if there was an elderly lady with them. <laughs> of course I would. There was no one else. Only the four girls. Bumfer was far from satisfied. On the morning of Wednesday the 18th, he arrived at Appleyard College in a buggy and pair for the purpose of driving Edith Horton and the French governess to the picnic grounds at Hanging Rock. Now they were standing at the exact spot where Edith and the other three girls had crossed the creek by the pool. Now then, Miss Edith, in which direction do you say you began walking the other day? I don't say. One gum tree's the same as another to me. Edith, chérie, perhaps you could tell the sergeant what you four girls were chattering of just then. I'm sure they were chattering, Monsieur Bonfair. That's the idea. Miss Edith, did anyone suggest which way they wanted to go? Marion Quaid was teasing me. Marion can be very disagreeable sometimes. She said those peaky things up there were a million years old. So you were walking towards the peaks? I suppose so. My feet were hurting. I didn't pay much attention. Miss Edith, just take a look around from here and see if there's anything at all that you can recognise. Stumps, ferns, queer-shaped rocks. No, there isn't. Oh, well, never mind. Mr. Bumfer, there is one thing I seem to remember. Fine. What was it? A cloud. A, a funny sort of cloud. A cloud? Fine. Except that clouds, unfortunately, have a way of moving from one place to another in the sky, you know. I am quite aware of that. This one was a nasty red colour. It was just after I passed Miss McCraw. Miss McCraw? You saw Miss McCraw. I don't know if you realise, Miss Edith, that what you have told me is very important. That's why I'm telling you. Where was she when you saw her? Close by, a long way off? I don't know. I only saw her in the distance through the trees as I was running back to the creek. And Miss McCraw was walking uphill in the opposite direction. Is this correct? Oh, mercy. She did look so funny. Why? Why did she look so funny? Um, I'd rather not say. Please, tell us, Edith. You're giving Monsieur Bumfer such valuable help. Her <laughs> skirt. What about her skirt? <laughs> it's too rude to say out loud in mixed company. <laughs> Edith was whispering something into Mademoiselle's ear. <laughs> She says, Constable, that Miss McCraw was not wearing a skirt, only les pantalons. Miss Edith, you are positive this woman you saw in the distance walking uphill through the trees was really Miss McCraw? Positive. Wasn't it a bit hard to recognize her without her dress? <laughs> not at all. None of the other teachers are such a peculiar shape. And that was the last piece of factual information to be extracted from Edith Horton. On the afternoon of February the 19th, Michael and Albert were seated in amicable silence in the rustic boathouse fronting Colonel Fitzhubert's ornamental lake. Michael was taking a temporary respite from his aunt's annual garden party. The lake was deep and dark, icy cold despite the languorous summer heat. On a patch of lily pads, a single white swan was standing on one leg, now and then sending out showers of concentric ripples across the surface of the lake. On the opposite side, the guests were strolling under the elms and oaks. The blue Danube drifted over the water from the rose garden. Mm. It's gone five already. I promised my aunt I'd show Miss Stack the rose garden. Stack? The one with a pair of legs on her, like champagne bottles. <laughs> I've seen her getting out of the dog cart this afternoon. Jeez, that reminds me. The groom was telling me the cops are the bloodhounds out at Hanging Rock again today. What for? 
Have they found anything new? No bloody fear. If the bloody dogs can't find them, what's the sense of you and me worrying our guts out? Plenty of other people have got themselves bushed before today. As far as I'm concerned, that's the stone end of it. As far as I'm concerned, it's not the end of it. I wake up in a cold sweat every night wondering if they're still alive, dying of thirst somewhere on that infernal rock. If you take me advice, the sooner you forget the whole thing, the better. I can't forget it. I never will. The white swan, poised all this time on the lily pads, now chose to stretch one leg and then the other and go flapping away across the lake towards the opposite bank. The two men watched its flight in silence until it disappeared amongst the reeds. I've been working out a plan. It'll keep. Better hop out, hadn't you? Your aunt will be raising hell if you're not on show. Confound my aunt! I've decided to make a search of the rock on my own, in my own way. No police, no bloodhounds, just you and me. That is if you'll come along and show me the ropes. We could get off to an early start and be home here for dinner without any awkward questions. How about it? Barmy. Nuts. You run along and show Miss Bottle Eggs them roses and you and me have a yarn about it some other time. I lied to you just now about a plan. It's not really so much a plan as a feeling. All my life, I've been doing things because other people said they were the right things to do. This time I'm going to do something because I say so, even if you and everyone else thinks I'm mad. Feelings is all very well, but every inch of that bloody rock has been gone over with a tooth comb. What the hell do you think you can do? Then I'll be going alone. Who says you're going alone? We're mates, aren't we? Then you will. Of course I will. Okay, I won't take much fixing. We don't want nothing but a bit of tucker for you and me and a feed for the two horses. When do you reckon we go? Tomorrow, if you can get away. How early can you start? A restless, windy night was followed by a calm, windless dawn. Michael crossed the croquet lawn, heavy with dew. For the first time since the events of last Saturday, he felt almost light-hearted. At the stables, he found Albert tightening up the girth of the white pony. Good morning. Hi. Hope you had the sense to get yourself a cuppa. I've brought my flask filled with brandy and matches. Was there anything else? Only a tucker in the billy with a couple of mugs and a clasp knife, some clean rags and a drop of iodine. You never know what we might find once we start looking. Jeez, don't look so bloody miserable. It's your own idea. Whoa there, Lancer. He's a bit lively first thing in the morning, aren't you, old boy? Right, let's get off. So much had happened since last Saturday that it was a shock to find everything exactly the same. The ashes of their picnic still filled the blackened ring of the fireplace. The creek gurgled over the smooth stones. Michael stood at the place where the four girls had crossed. Here, the dark one with the ringlets had stood for a moment before she jumped, laughing and shaking her curls. The thin one in the middle had cleared without hesitation and never looked back. The dumpy one had nearly missed her footing on a loose stone. Miranda, tall and fair, skimmed it like a white swan. Miranda, lingering for a moment on the opposite bank to push back a lock of hair so that he saw, for the first time, her grave and lovely face. It was arranged that each of the young men should take a given area, searching it with special regard for caves, overhanging rocks, fallen logs, or anything capable of affording the slightest shelter to the missing girls. Albert set off whistling to make a careful examination of the lower slopes. What a bloody goose chase, if ever there was one. Fronds of curled brown velvet snapped under his touch as Michael's boots trod down the neat abodes of ants and spiders. The rise grew steeper, the undergrowth denser. Behind him, perhaps 50 yards below, lay the pool. Directly ahead, a thinly wooded incline. Somewhere here, perhaps on this very spot, Miranda had led the way and plunged into the dogwood, as Michael himself was doing now. He was still stumbling and climbing with no particular plan in mind, when he was halted by a faint but unmistakable cooey at his back. 
He had lost count of time, and looking over his shoulder was surprised to see the picnic grounds diminished to a patch of pink and gold light between the trees. He remembered his promise to rejoin Albert at the pool no later than four o'clock. It was already half past five. From a pigskin notebook in his pocket, he tore out several leaves and carefully stuck them on the twigs of a bush of mountain laurel, like little white flags, and retraced his steps down to the creek. Albert had seen nothing out of the ordinary and was itching to get back to Lake View and his evening meal. Geez, I began to think he was lost. What the hell was he doing up there all that long? Just looking. I put some flags on a bush out of my pocketbook so I could find it again. <laughs> Smart Al, can't you? Well, drink your tea and we'll get a move on. I'm not going home. Not tonight. Have you gone off your rocker? You can tell them up at the house. I'm staying the night in Wood End. Any bloody lie you like. It'll be dark soon. What's the good of you stopping here all night? That's my business. Beats me, but if that's the way he was feeling, I'll be hitting the trail. And mind you put out the fire before you leave tomorrow. I don't fancy spending my weekend fighting bushfires at Hanging Rock. Lancer was impatient and Albert cantered off. He was soon out of sight. Across the level golden plain, long shadows were creeping out of the forest over the thin lines of post and rail fences, a few scattered sheep, a windmill with motionless silver sails catching the last of the sun. On the rock, darkness stored all day in its fettered holes and caves seeped out into the twilight. Michael rekindled the dying fire. Behind him, the rock pressed unseen against the starless sky. A pile of bracken fern made a fairly comfortable bed, although the night air set him shivering the moment he lay down. When the first glimmer of daylight showed, he was already boiling the billy for tea, gulping it down with a morsel of dried bread. He had no definite plan of action, only a compulsion to begin the search again. The stunted laurel was easily located by the scraps of paper, now limp with dew. A parrot flashed through the trees ahead, where magpies were gurgling in full throat. Veiled in lacy green foliage, the formidable buttresses of the hanging rock were not yet in view. He found himself on a natural platform of rock ringed with stones, boulders and clumps of wiry fern, shaded by straggling eucalypts. Here he was forced to rest his leaden legs. His head, on the contrary, was like an air balloon tethered somewhere above his aching shoulders. A sloping rock offered meagre shade. He laid his head on a stone and fell instantly into a thin, ragged sleep of exhaustion. <clears throat> Waking with a sudden Ooh. stab of pain over one eye, he saw the eucalypts, their long pointed silver leaves hanging motionless on the heavy air. It seemed to be coming from all around him. A wordless murmur, like distant voices, with now and then a sort of trilling that might have been little spurts of laughter. But who could be laughing down here under the sea? He was forcing his way through the viscous dark green water, looking for the sweet, tinkling voice, sometimes behind, sometimes just ahead. If only he could move faster, he might catch up with it. Suddenly it ceased. The water grew thicker and darker. He saw bubbles rising from his mouth, began to choke, thought... This is what it feels like to drown. And woke up, coughing up the blood that was trickling down his cheek from the cut on his forehead. He was wide awake and stumbling to his feet when he heard her laughing a little way ahead. Miranda! Miranda! Where are you? There was no answering voice. He began running as well as he could towards the belt of scrub. The prickly green dogwood tore at his skin. Miranda! Now high rocks and boulders blocked his path, each a nightmare obstacle. They grew larger and more fantastic. Where, where are you? Miranda! He saw the monolith black against the sun. 
A scatter of pebbles went rolling down into the chasm below as he slipped and fell. A spear of pain jabbed at his ankle. He got up again and started hauling himself onto the next boulder. There was only one conscious thought in his mind. Go on. Go on. Michael went on climbing. It was a new sensation for Albert to be troubled by anything beyond his own immediate affairs, and he didn't care for it. Albert passed the night in a succession of disturbing dreams in which the voice of Michael kept calling for help. Albert. Sometimes it came Albert. drifting in from the lake, Albert. sometimes almost beside him, close to his ear. Albert. It was a positive relief when the sun rose and it was time to get up. Directly after breakfast, Albert pinned a note on the stable door, saddled up Lancer and set off for the picnic grounds. Home soon. He had written with deliberate intent to deceive and delay. Come on, old boy. The hanging rock rose up in violent contrasts of midday light and shade. It was cool and pleasant in the shade by the pool. At first glance, everything looked much the same as last night. The ashes of Michael's fire, his hat hung from the same overhanging branch. Albert's doubts and fears gave place to irritation, even anger. Bloody fool. I wouldn't mind betting he's gone and lost himself somewhere up there on the bloody rock. Hell, I shouldn't have got myself mixed up with all this. However, mixed up with it he was, to the extent of crawling laboriously in and out of the scrub in search of fresh tracks leading towards the rock. The narrow imprint of riding boots was easily picked up on the loose soil. He had only been following Michael's trail for 50 yards or so when he noticed another set of footprints, only a few feet away, almost parallel to the others, but coming downhill towards the pool. Funny thing, that. Looks like he went up and come down again the same way. Jeez, what's that over there? Michael was lying on his side, slumped over a tussock. One leg doubled up under him. He must have tripped and fallen heavily. Perhaps broken some ribs or an ankle. There was nothing to account for the cut across the forehead, nor the scratches on his face and arms. Albert had enough practical experience of broken bones not to attempt to move him to a more comfortable position. The brandy flask was still in the jacket pocket. He withdrew it gingerly, and forced a few drops between the other's lips. Michael moaned without opening his eyes as the liquid dribbled down his chin. Albert decided to go immediately for help. Come on. Dr. Mackenzie's gig was soon heading towards the picnic grounds. Michael was still lying exactly as Albert had left him. After a brisk professional appraisement, he was expertly hoisted onto the gig. It was close to midnight when the little procession turned into the avenue at Lakeview. Michael was put to bed with an eiderdown and hot bottles. Albert flung himself fully clothed on his unmade truckle bed and fell asleep. He seemed hardly to have laid his head on the pillow before he was wide awake and staring at the grey light at the window. The events of yesterday falling neatly into place like the pieces of a puzzle, except that one of the key pieces was missing. Which was it, and exactly where did it fit in the pattern? Better start at the beginning, when he had found Michael slumped over the tussock on Saturday morning. How far had he wandered before he had fallen and injured his ankle? Had he gone back to the laurel bush and started again from there? Those silly little paper flags. The next minute, Albert sprung out of bed and was pulling on his boots. He slipped silently into the dark, shuttered house and Michael's room. Michael was lying on his back, drugged and faintly moaning. His riding breeches, badly torn and stained, were hanging over the back of the chair. Albert slid a cautious hand into the pockets. The pigskin notebook was still there. He began slowly deciphering the scribbled entries page by page. They appeared to begin in March last year, starting off with an appointment at a Cambridge address. A cure for distemper, copied from country life. At last, he came upon a scrawl of crooked capitals in pencil. Albert, above bush, my flags. Hurry, ring of high, up high. Hurry, found. Here the writing petered out. Albert tore out the page and put the notebook back in the breeches pocket. 
above bush, my flags. Hurry. He could feel Michael looking over his shoulder, trying to tell him that he had found an important clue high up on the rock, so important that he'd been trying to write down the instructions for Albert when he had passed out. My flags. Convinced that there was no time to lose, he had the colonel roused by the sleep-sodden housemaid to notify the Wood End police station. Meanwhile, Albert had ridden off to join the police party on the road to the rock. The sun was high as they drove through the gates of the picnic grounds. In silence, they plodded uphill following the bruised and broken fern. High on the cloudless sky, the topmost peaks glittered like gold. When they arrived at the balancing boulders, Albert would have given a pound to go into the scrub and be sick. The little dark one with the curls was lying face downwards on a ledge of sloping rock. One arm flung out over her head like a girl fallen asleep on a hot afternoon. Above the blood-stained muslin bodice, swarms of tiny flies clustered. The much publicized ringlets were matted with dust and blood. Girl's body on rock. Missing heiress found. Once again, the college mystery was front page news. Irma was still unconscious at Lake View, and the Honourable Michael Fitzhubert was not well enough to be questioned. Behind the closed doors of her study, Mrs. Appleyard permitted herself a cold-blooded scrutiny of this new turn of affairs. With the finding of only one of the four missing persons, the situation, as it affected the college, had actually deteriorated. Her father called with a seemingly reasonable excuse for taking his daughter away with him there and then. Worst still... The French governess had handed in her resignation. There was a pile of correspondence on Mrs. Appleyard's desk this evening. She took the brandy bottle from the cupboard and opened two letters before noticing Mr. Leopold's telegram. Under no circumstances is my daughter to return to Appleyard College. Letter follows. To lose in such a manner her richest and most admired pupil made her feel physically faint, almost sick. Two enormous bills from butcher and grocer completed the day's tally of woe. Late as it was, she felt impelled to take out the college ledger. Several of the boarders' fees were outstanding. On the neatly ruled page, another name stood out. Sarah Wayborn. At the present moment, a whole term still unpaid for. The following morning, Sarah was summoned to the headmistress's desk. I have sent for you, Sarah, because of a serious matter I have to explain to you. Stand up straight and listen very carefully to what I have to say. Yes, Mrs. Appleyard. I don't know if you are aware that your guardian has failed to pay for your education here for several months. I have written to him at the usual bank address, but my letters have been returned in every case. Oh. If I have not heard from your guardian by Easter... I shall be obliged to make other arrangements for your education. What arrangements? That will have to be decided. There are institutions. Oh, no. No. Not that. Not again. One must learn to face up to facts, Sarah. You may go. Both Michael and Irma were progressing favourably. The weather continued warm and sunny and there were daily outings on the placid lake. Together, they had explored every inch of the Colonel's rose garden, the vegetable garden, the sunken croquet lawn, the shrubberies whose winding walks ended in delicious little arbours. Now in the late afternoon, the lake grew cold under the slanting shadows and a few yellowing leaves floated amongst the reeds. Darling Michael, I can't bear to think that summer is almost over and no more rose on the lake. Just as well, actually. The old punt isn't safe to take out again. (laughs) Miranda used to say that everything begins and ends 
at exactly the right time and place. Sorry, did I splash you? <laughs> Those confounded lily roots. At the landing stage, secret in the half-light, a white swan was rising gracefully out of the reeds. They stood for a moment, watching it flapping away over the water until it disappeared amongst the willows on the opposite bank. It was like this that Irma would later remember Michael Fitzhubert most clearly. Quite suddenly he would come to her in the Bois de Boulogne, under the trees in Hyde Park, a lock of fair hair hanging over one eye, his face half turned to follow the flight of a swan. The last row on the lake, the last light pressure of a hand, unseen, unrecorded. The pattern of the picnic continued to darken and spread. At two o'clock on the afternoon of Thursday the 19th of March, Appleyard College was cold, silent and smelling of roast mutton and cabbage. Hussey's cab came up the drive. From it, alighted Irma in a scarlet cloak and a little toque of scarlet feathers. The headmistress herself swept the visitor into the study. There was an endless moment of silence as Mrs. Appleyard seated herself. Be seated, Irma. I hear you are completely restored to health. Thank you, Mrs. Appleyard. I am perfectly well now. I understand you are leaving for Europe shortly. In a few days, I hope. My parents think it is a good idea to get away from Australia for a time. I see. To be frank with you, Irma, I regret that your parents didn't think fit for you to complete your education at Appleyard College before embarking on a purely social life abroad. I am 17, Mrs. Appleyard. Old enough to learn something of the world. If I may say so, now that you are no longer under my care. Even a girl with your expectations should be able to spell. <laughs> spelling! Would spelling have saved me from whatever it was that happened the day of the picnic? Let me tell you this, Mrs. Appleyard. Anything of the slightest importance that I learned here at the college, I learned from Miranda. It is a pity that you did not acquire something of Miranda's admirable self-control. I should like to see the girls and Mademoiselle before I go. By all means. Mademoiselle and Miss Lumley will be taking the class in the gymnasium. For once, I think discipline may be relaxed. You may go in and say goodbye. A glacial handshake was exchanged as Irma left for the last time the room where she had so often stood long, long ago as a schoolgirl, awaiting the commands and reprimands at the headmistress's pleasure. She was no longer afraid of the woman behind the closed door, whose hand, seized with an uncontrollable tremor, reached for the bottle of cognac under the desk. The gymnasium, commonly known to the boarders as the Chamber of Horrors, was a long, narrow room in the west wing, lit only by a row of barred skylights. In one corner stood a padded horizontal board fitted with leather straps, on which the child Sarah, continually in trouble for stooping, was to pass the gymnasium hour this afternoon. Miss Lumley and Mademoiselle were already on duty, the latter seated at the upright piano, hammering out the March of the Men of Harlech, one, two, one, two. Three rows of girls listlessly dipped and rose in time to the martial strain. The door of the gymnasium was opening. Every head in the room turned. Irma Leopold, a radiant figure, stood on the threshold. Come in, Irma. Come, c'est une bonne surprise. Mes enfants, for ten minutes, you may talk as you please. Irma, who had taken a few steps towards the centre of the room, now paused uncertainly and smiled. There were no answering smiles, no hum of excited greeting. Sick at heart, the governess looked down at the upturned faces below. Not one was looking at Irma. Fourteen pairs of eyes fixed on something behind her, through and beyond the whitewashed walls. 
It is the glazed inward stare of people who walk in their sleep. They see the walls of the gymnasium fading into the brilliant sky above the hanging rock. They're at the picnic. Lunch is set out by the creek. They see Marion Quaid, a sandwich in one hand and a pencil in the other, and Miss McCraw, forgetting to eat, propped up against a tree. Irma, in white muslin, shaking out her curls and laughing at Miranda washing out cups at the creek. Miranda, hatless, with shining yellow hair. The shadow of the rock has grown darker and longer. I cannot move. The dreadful shape is a living monster lumbering towards them, scattering rocks and boulders. So near now, they can see the cracks and hollows where the lost girls lie rotting in a filthy cave. Someone knocks over a wooden stool and Edith screams out loud. Edith, stop that. Au revoir, noise. Lost. Juliana, be silent. All of you, be silent. Serious, Manzo. They won't take any notice. The class is quite out of hand. Try to get out of the room by the side door and bring the head. This is serious. You are afraid, aren't you? Yes, Miss Lenny. I am very much afraid. Above a sea of thrusting heads and shoulders, Irma, limp and utterly bewildered, was near suffocation, hemmed in by angry faces. She tried in vain to push them away. A disembodied moon face rose up somewhere in the background. Edith, you. Miss Ducky, it's me. Come on, Irma, tell us. We've waited long enough. Tell us. What can I tell you? Have you all gone crazy? The hanging rock. We want you to tell us what happened up there to Miranda and Marion Quay. I can't tell you. I don't know. Suddenly, Mademoiselle was standing beside her, holding Irma's arm. And this is, have you no brains, no hearts? How can the poor Irma tell us something she does not know? She knows all right. I'll tell you if she won't. They're dead. Dead. Miranda and Marion and Miss McCall. All dead as doornails in a nasty cave full of bats on hanging rock. Edith Hutton. You are a liar and a fool. Edith pressed a hand to her burning cheek. Irma shook herself free. It was all over, as simply and quickly as that, with the girls falling back into the old, orderly manner to let Irma pass between them and Mademoiselle kissing her lightly on the cheek. You will find your parasol hanging up in the hall, ma chérie. Au revoir. We shall meet again. So Irma Leopold passed from Appleyard College and out of their lives. Mademoiselle consulted her watch. We are late this afternoon, girls. Go at once to your rooms and change to something pretty for supper tonight. Can I wear my pink? You may wear what you like, Edith. The door closed on the empty room. It is no easy matter to emerge with dignity from a crouching position in a narrow cupboard with one eye glued to the keyhole. Dora Lumley now thought it prudent to step out from safe asylum. I might have guessed. You made no attempt to give my message to the head. It seemed better to stay here until it was over. In the cupboard? Well, why not? The girls were making a disgraceful exhibition of themselves. What are we going to tell Mrs. Appleyard? Nothing. Nothing? You heard me. Exactly nothing. If I had my way, they should be whipped. I shall inform Mrs. Appleyard myself of these disgraceful goings on this very night. You see this Indian club, Miss Lamley? Unless you give me a promise before you leave this room that you will not tell one little word of what happened here this afternoon, I will eat you with it. Very hard indeed. And nobody will suspect the French governess. You understand what I say? You are not fit to be in authority over innocent young girls. I agree. I was brought up expecting something much more entertaining. Alors c'est la vie. You promise? Dora Lumley, looking desperately towards the closed door, decided the necessary dash was too much for her fallen arches and heaving chest. The French woman was idly twirling the Indian club. I am perfectly serious. Miss Lumley. I promise. Mademoiselle calmly replaced the club. Ah! Mercy on us! What's that strange sound? From the far corner of the room, now almost in darkness, came a single rasping cry. Miss Lumley, under the stress of a most unpleasant afternoon, 
had forgotten to unfasten the leather straps that held the child, Sarah, rigid on the horizontal board. There were only five more days left until the college broke up for the Easter vacation. Saturday was usually a day taken up with small domesticities and household tasks. The boarders did their mending, wrote their letters home, played croquet or lawn tennis in fine weather. Sarah Wayborn had passed the afternoon in wandering about the grounds with a book. Struck by the child's increasing pallor, Mademoiselle made up her mind to send for Dr Mackenzie. Not only Sarah, but Mrs Appleyard was in need of attention. She had lost a great deal of weight in the past few weeks and the full silk skirts hung loosely about her massive hips. The flaccid cheeks were sometimes pale and sunken, sometimes mottled a dull red. The headmistress caught sight of Minnie coming up from the back stairs with a tray. Have we an invalid in the house? It's Miss Sarah's supper, ma'am. The child's feeling poorly. Kindly tell Miss Sarah not to put her light out until she has had a word with me. On the morning of Sunday the 22nd of March, Appleyard College presented the usual scene of bustling preparation as the boarders arrayed themselves for church going in Wood End. Although it was Minnie's day off, the place was all anyhow and the good-natured housemaid had remained on duty. To her surprise, she saw the headmistress almost running downstairs carrying what looked like a small basket. At the sight of the housemaid, Mrs Appleyard stopped hanging onto the stair rail as if she were feeling giddy. Minnie, surely this is your day off. It don't matter, ma'am. We're all behind this morning. Is Alice on duty? No, ma'am. Did you want her for anything? On the contrary. You look tired. Minnie, why don't you go and lie down? I'll lay my tables first. Besides, somebody might call. Exactly. I, I was about to tell you that I am expecting Mr Cosgrove sometime this morning. Miss Sarah's guardian. I can easily answer the door myself. Well, ma'am, it don't seem right. Do as I say and leave me. As soon as Mademoiselle had returned from church, she presented herself at the study door. Come in, Mademoiselle. What is it? Might I have a few words with you, madame, before déjeuner, à propos de Sarah Wayborn? The governess was unprepared for the expression that creased the older woman's face like an evil wind. What about Sarah Wayborn? Mademoiselle, you are wasting my time and your own. Sarah Wayborn left here this morning with her guardian. Oh, no. Uh, no. The poor child was not fit to take a journey. She appeared well enough this morning. Ah. Oh. Oh, the poor enfant. A troublemaker from the very first. An orphan. One must, for those lonely ones, make excuses. In fact, I doubt whether I shall accept her here for another term. However, that can be dealt with later. Mr Cosgrove was insistent on taking the child with him there and then. It was most inconvenient, but I had no choice in the matter. I regret that I was not here to help her pack. I myself helped Sarah to put a few things she specially wanted in her little covered basket. Mr Cosgrove was waiting downstairs in a hurry to get away. There it is. The child has gone. Tuesday passed without incident. There was a welcome sense of freedom for the boarders by the excited preparation for Wednesday's wholesale exodus for the Easter holidays. It was a long time since so much whispering and comparing of notes and even occasional laughter had been heard at Appleyard College. Mademoiselle found herself occupied most of the day in all manner of small domesticities. During the morning, Alice, the under-housemaid, appeared on the landing, armed with a bucket and brooms. Minnie says for me to do out the big double room, but there's that many clothes and things lying about, I don't know where to begin. I'll help you. Miranda's old room was almost in darkness when they opened the door. Sarah's bed, still unmade and rumpled as she had slept in at last. The blinds rattled up on a scene of depressing disorder. Sarah's dressing gown over the back of a chair. A pair of bedroom slippers on the washstand. Well, I never. She don't seem to have taken much with her. Here's a nightdress in a sponge bag with a sponge still in it. Madame told me she had only packed a few necessary articles in a small basket for the journey. 
beats me why young Sarah didn't go off on Sunday morning in this nice blue coat. Mrs. Sarah left in a hurry, and what she chose to wear for the journey has nothing to do with you, Alice. If you would please attend to the dusting, it must be nearly lunchtime. She glanced up at the stopped clock on the marble mantelpiece, where a photograph of Miranda smiled calmly down from a small silver frame. Alice went on dusting in offended silence, and Mademoiselle stood looking up thoughtfully at the portrait of Miranda. Mademoiselle was especially wakeful on Tuesday night. The moon, large and brilliant, threw a silver shaft between the partly drawn curtains at her open window. Sleep was impossible. The moment she closed her eyes, she began thinking about the child, Sarah. What did the future hold for the lonely, unloved child? Miranda was the only one at the college who had ever made Sarah smile, and now Miranda was gone. Miranda. Miranda smiling down from the mantelpiece in the oval frame was Sarah's most treasured possession. What could have occurred on Sunday morning to make her forget to take the portrait? Such a little thing, so easily carried. Sarah was in a hurry and forgot her dressing gown, a sponge bag, easily forgotten, but not the portrait. Never, never the portrait forgotten and left behind. A puff of night air blew the lace curtains into the room. She was cold, dreadfully cold, and afraid. By the afternoon of Wednesday, the twenty-fifth, the last of Hussey's cabs had carried the last of the boarders and Mademoiselle down the drive. The silent rooms overflowed with drifts of paper, dropped pins, scraps of ribbon and string. From the staircase, the grandfather clock had become so loud that Mrs. Appleyard fancied she could hear its everlasting tick-tock through the study wall, minute by minute, hour by hour, like a heart beating in a body already dead. Thursday was unseasonably warm. By twelve o'clock, it was almost hot. Mr. Whitehead had taken off his coat to fork over the dahlias when he noticed an offensive smell coming from the direction of the hydrangeas. To his annoyance, he saw that one of the tallest and most handsome plants, a few feet out from the wall directly below the tower, had been badly crushed and broken. The beautiful blue heads limp on their stalks. The gardener removed his waistcoat and began crawling carefully between the bushes so as not to disturb the young growth at the base of the roots. He was within a few feet of the damaged bush when he saw something white beside it on the ground. Oh, good lord! Something that had once been a girl in a nightdress, soaked with dried blood. One leg was bent under the tangled body; the other wedged in the lower fork of the hydrangea. The feet were bare. The head was crushed beyond recognition. Even so, he knew that it was Sarah Wayborn. No other girl at the college was so small, with such thin arms and legs. Extract from a statement by Edward Whitehead, gardener at Apple Yard College, as given to Constable Bumper. Oh, this was a terrible shock for me, and a terrible thing to have to tell Madam after what she'd had to go through lately. She nearly jumped out of her skin when she saw me. I can't remember exactly what I said about finding the body. At first, she just stood there as if she hadn't heard a word I'd been saying. Then she told me to say it all again, very slowly, which I did. When I'd finished, she asked, "Who was it? Who was it?" Sarah Wayborn. I said, "Are you quite sure the girl was dead?" I said, "Yes, quite sure." I didn't tell her why. <sighs> She let out a sort of smothered scream, more like a wild animal than a human being. I won't forget the sound of that scream if I live to be a hundred. She got out a bottle and poured a stiff brandy for herself and one for me, which I refused. I asked if I should fetch the cook, who was the only other person in the house at the time. No, you fool. You can take me into the police station. When we were within a、oh, hundred yards of the police station, opposite Hussey's livery stables, she told me to pull up. She got out and went over to the seat where Hussey's passengers wait for the cabs. 
She said I was to drive straight home. I didn't like leaving her there in the street, however, I thought it best to obey orders. She was still sitting on the seat straight as a poker when I turned the pony round to go home. And that was the last time I saw her. Although she had seen the hanging rock for the first time this afternoon, Mrs Appleyard was only too familiar with its general aspect and the various key points of the picnic grounds as depicted in the Melbourne press. Here was the sagging wooden gate through which Ben Hussey had driven his five-horse drag. There was the creek holding the last of the afternoon light in its placid pools. To the left, a little way ahead, the much-photographed spot where the picnic party from Lakeview had camped. To the right, the vertical walls of the rock were already in deep shade, the undergrowth at the base exuding the dank forest breath of decay. She started to walk along the track towards the creek. When the ground started to rise towards the rock, she knew that she must turn right into the waist-high bracken and begin to climb. The ground was rough under the large, soft feet in kid button-up boots. For the first time, it dawned on her what it meant to climb the rock on a hot afternoon, as the lost girls had climbed it long, long ago, in full-skirted summer frocks and thin shoes. Stumbling and sweating upwards through the bracken and dogwood, she thought of them now, without compassion, dead. Both dead. And now Sarah lying under the tower. When presently the monolith came into view, she recognised it at once from the photographs. It was as much as she could do to clamber towards it, over the last few yards of stones that slid from under her feet with every step. To the right, a narrow ledge overhung a precipice at which she dare not look. To the left, on higher ground, a pile of stones. On one of them, a large black spider spread eagled fast asleep in the sun. She had always been afraid of spiders. Looked round for something with which to strike it and saw Sarah Wayborn in a nightdress, with one eye fixed and staring from a mask of rotting flesh. An eagle hovering high above the golden peaks heard her scream as she ran towards the precipice and jumped. The spider scuttled to safety as the clumsy body went bouncing and rolling from rock to rock towards the valley below, until at last the head was impaled on a jutting crag. 